Today, we're going to talk about Trump's Postmaster General Louis DeJoy's continued efforts to dismantle the Postal Service and the pushback he's finally facing by Democrats and my interview with Congressman Eric Swalwell, where we discuss how to ensure that the USPS gets funded, as well as whether Trump and DeJoy have criminal liability for this scheme. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen, and you're listening to No Lie. So apparently Trump's efforts to sabotage the Postal Service are not going to be a fleeting story, right? And on one hand, I'm glad that this is getting concentrated attention across every media outlet and isn't just some daily scandal that Trump pulls off and gets away with. On the other hand, the fact that it is getting so much attention is a testament to the fact that what's happening is really, really bad. Like, I've only seen this kind of prolonged and focused media attention on one thing a handful of times, like when Trump tried to repeal Obamacare, uh, when he nominated Kavanaugh, and obviously his failed response to the pandemic. All of these were major events and all wildly unpopular with the majority of the American people. So last week I spoke about DeJoy having consolidated power at USPS, pushing out two dozen top-tier executives. I also spoke about the Trump team having considered a bunch of executive actions to undermine mail-in voting, like uh, forcing the post office to not deliver certain ballots and stopping election officials from counting ballots that arrive after election day. Those were bad. I called the situation a five-alarm fire. But what's happened this week just blows all of that out of the water. So this week, we learned that DeJoy has decommissioned 671 sorting machines, which accounts for 10% of the Postal Service's inventory. Those machines have the capacity to sort 21.4 million pieces of paper mail per hour. And this is happening at the same time that Americans are gearing up to mail tens of millions of ballots that need to arrive in a timely manner. There is no way that you could be a sane, rational person and not recognize that the intent here, the sole intent, is to make sure that the Postal Service won't be able to handle election mail. And then, like clockwork, we learned that the USPS sent letters to 46 states plus Washington, D.C., warning that it cannot guarantee that all mail-in ballots are going to arrive in time for the November election. And not just a few million of the uh, roughly 234 million Americans who could vote by mail, 226 million are in jeopardy of being impacted. That leaves a whopping 8 million who are in the clear. So hey, nothing to worry about. You only have a 96% chance of being disenfranchised. Which brings me back to my first point. This seems like a really bad time to start decommissioning sorting machines, doesn't it? This would be like if we started sending all of our PPE to China just as coronavirus started spreading across the world. <laughs> like, uh, the joke is that we literally did that. And finally, here's, here's the kicker, because then the Postal Service began removing mailboxes, physically removing them. It's, it's, it's almost comical. Like, how much more on-the-nose voter suppression can you get than taking away the literal mailboxes? Not only are they fighting in court to prevent us from voting safely by mail during a pandemic, not only are they uh, purposefully creating logistical delays in the mail delivery, but they are taking the mailboxes away. It's like the trolling phase of voter suppression that even if you do manage to get your ballot and fill it out and prep it to send back, good luck finding a mailbox because they stole them all. And by the way, we don't even have to pretend anymore that the intent of all this is anything other than sabotaging the election because Donald Trump, a uh, uh, resident genius, admitted that the whole point of starving the agency of funding was to ensure that the USPS wouldn't be able to handle mail-in ballots for the election. They want three and a half trillion uh, billion dollars for the mail-in votes. Okay, universal mail-in ballots. Three and a half trillion. They want twenty-five billion dollars. Billion for the post office. Now they need that money in order to have the post office work, so it can take all of these millions and millions of ballots. Now, in the meantime, they aren't getting there. By the way, those are just two items. But if they don't get those two items, that means you can't have universal mail-in voting because they're not equipped to have it. Here's the thing. As Americans, we just assume that this kind of stuff can't happen here, right? Like, our schemas don't allow us to accept that this would be a reality in the United States of America. And so when we finally do come to accept it, Trump's already 10 steps ahead because we spent so much time just coming to terms with it. What we have to realize is that just because the corruption happens 
out in the open doesn't mean it's less corrupt. So when Trump says on Fox News that he's going to starve the USPS of funding because he wants to make sure that the agency can't handle mail-in ballots, we have to be able to acknowledge that that is right out of the authoritarian playbook. And not only can it happen here, but it is happening here. It doesn't have to be behind closed doors uh, or under the cloak of darkness. Sometimes it's just right there on TV. So I want to switch uh, gears here for a sec because I think some background is important. I want to talk about why the Postal Service is in the financial situation that it's in and how it's not an accident and how this didn't start with Donald Trump, although, you know, that that doesn't in any way diffuse his responsibility. The Postal Service had been running smoothly from its inception until basically 2006 when the Republican-led Congress passed the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. And it was signed into law by George W. Bush, and it required the Postal Service to pre-fund the next 75 years of its pensions. Pensions would normally be funded as they went, right? They'd, they'd pull out of their pension fund and add to it as retirees' costs came in. But with this new law, the next 75 years of pensions had to be funded in full, and it had to be done immediately. Just so we're clear, this isn't done anywhere else. No one's pension in any company is pre-funded. You pay into it. Just like you pay into your Social Security and you pay into your Medicare, just like you pay off your mortgage payments. Think of it like this. Imagine, imagine you were renting an apartment and your landlord mandated that you pay the next 30 years of rent up front. If you had 30 years of rent up front, you wouldn't need to live in an apartment. So it doesn't make any sense. Just like pre-funding 75 years of retiree benefits doesn't make sense. The point of these funds is that they're added to over time. So even though no other entity has to pre-fund pensions and, and to do it 75 years out, no less, the Postal Service suddenly had to put away an extra $5.6 billion a year to do this. And lo and behold, uh, it took all of six years before the USPS began defaulting on its obligations. By 2016, the Postal Service had lost $62.4 billion. Even its own inspector general uh, admitted that the cause of that was pre-funding its retiree benefits. And worse, the law also required the Postal Service to invest its retiree funds exclusively in government bonds, which will give you the lowest returns of any investment. So even the insane directive to sock away billions of dollars was exacerbated by the fact that the Postal Service couldn't even make any money on those funds because the government forced the service to buy its own bonds. So they got doubly screwed over. But the purpose of these rules was to hobble the Postal Service because Republicans have always wanted to privatize it. And so they did what they always do. They, they created a problem and then pointed to that problem that they themselves created as proof that the agency should be privatized. They literally govern by mismanagement. And here's the thing, too. Even if the post office wasn't being sabotaged by Republicans by forcing the agency to, to pre-fund pensions 75 years out, the post office is not a business. It's a service. It doesn't need to be profitable. The military isn't profitable. Libraries aren't profitable. Public schools aren't profitable. I know it's going to be tough for Republicans to wrap their minds around this, but not everything has to make money. Sometimes things can exist so that societies can function. Sometimes a billionaire CEO isn't necessary. I know that, that that's insane, right? Oh, and by the way, while we're on the subject of DeJoy's efforts to turn the ship around and institute these absolutely critical changes at the post office, which, again, have been running smoothly for over 200 years, you know how much all of these austerity measures, like, uh, like eliminating overtime and reducing transportation costs, you know how much they're going to save the agency? $200 million. That's what all of this is for. $200 million. The government spent $1.7 billion last year maintaining empty buildings. That's not a joke. Trump's golf habit alone has cost nearly $140 million. But apparently, we're about to let the most popular service in the country fail 80 days before when we need it most because we need to save what amounts to basically a rounding error in the federal budget. Completely insane. And none of this was lost on the American people or on Congress, which is why, finally, it looks like there are consequences for DeJoy on the horizon. The post office inspector general is now reviewing 
DeJoy's policy changes and possible conflicts of interest after a request by Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Aside from that, there have been references to the U.S. Code, which states that it's a felony to delay the mail. And and DeJoy will hide behind this excuse that, you know, he's not delaying it. He's he's making it more efficient. But just saying it's efficient when it's not doesn't make it true. Then you have House Democrats who are threatening to use their inherent contempt powers to bring DeJoy in to testify. He's supposed to come in on September 17th, but I think it's been made abundantly clear that waiting another month isn't going to cut it. Uh, Democratic lawmakers are even calling for the sergeant at arms to arrest DeJoy if he refuses to come in. And I got to be honest, hearing Democrats finally use language that shows that they're willing to fight, to, to actually fight, is so welcome and so necessary. I cannot remember a time when Democrats didn't take the high road, when, when we didn't just sit idly by and, and watch as Mitch McConnell wrote the rules as he went. So there is honestly nothing I like seeing more than Democrats threatening to use every lever of government available to them for once. So regardless of what route is taken, what's clear here is that this isn't going away, that the Democrats are completely unified in their efforts to address this, and that both DeJoy and Trump have criminal exposure here. And those are all good things. Um, But with that said, I know a lot of you feel really discouraged, like, Like, it doesn't matter anymore. What's the point? Our votes aren't going to count. They're not even going to get there. But for Trump, that's the point. That's what he wants. He wants so much distrust and chaos that you don't believe that voting is going to make a difference. He's relying on you giving up. So I would just say, don't give him the satisfaction. Don't validate his entire strategy. You got to remember that no matter how much distrust and confusion and uh, pandemonium the guy causes, When your vote arrives, it's going to get counted, period. And if he loses, he's out, period. Forget the threats of calling it a rigged election. Uh, Forget the calls for delays. Forget all of his bullshit. Underneath all of it, just know that they will count those votes and a winner will be named. And if it's Joe Biden, then Trump's term expires on January 20th, 2021, and he will no longer be president. He wants you to think that it's futile, but I promise you, that his temper tantrums aren't going to have any material impact on the election results. So for us, we have a job. And I will repeat this every week if I have to. If you're voting by mail, request your ballot as soon as possible. And when you get it, fill it out and stick it right back in the mailbox. Or bring it to a drop box if your locality has them. Or bring it to the election office and drop it off in person. No matter how inconvenient they make it, you make sure you vote. And you make sure your family does the same. Be responsible for your entire household. You make sure that every one of those ballots ends up where it needs to end up. That is our last, final job. And they're going to make it seem impossible, but it's not. It just means that we have to stay focused. To listen to my interview with Eric Swalwell, check out the interviews playlist on my YouTube channel. That's it for this episode. Talk to you next week. You've been listening to No Lie with Brian Tyler Cohen, produced by Sam Graber, music by Wellesley, interviews edited for YouTube and Facebook by Nick Nicotera, and recorded in Los Angeles, California. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on your preferred podcast app. Feel free to leave a five-star rating and a review, and check out briantylercohen.com for links to all of my other channels.